We're beginning a new sermon series today called Matters of Life and Death. So if you have your Bibles with you, turn to the book of 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians, we are going to be reading verses 1 to 10 together as we start this together today and hear what the Apostle Paul would encourage the church of Thessalonica with and what he would encourage you and I with today. I want to talk about life example today, life example. Now, as you think about this series as a whole, matters of life and death, I've heard that phrase uttered many times in different contexts. Um, Sometimes I hear that phrase and it's connected to something so trivial that it makes no sense. I heard a child yell, dad, dad, come quick. It's a matter of life and death. So I come running into the room and there's milk that has spilled literally on a hardwood floor. And I'm like, don't cry over spilled milk, kid. We can wipe this up. It's not a matter of life and death. It's not even that big of a deal. Other times I've heard people say it's not a matter of life and death, and it's actually something very serious. You think about vacation Bible school and working with kids and all of the effort that went into trying to share the gospel with these little kids. And some people are like, ah, I can't do that. I'm too busy. I got stuff to do around the house doesn't make a difference if I'm there or not. It's not like it's a matter of life and death. And actually, it is a matter of life and death. Like many of you, I've had a lot of conversations over the past few days about the impact of life as Roe versus Wade was overturned. And I heard people on all ends of the spectrum talking about this impact on their life. And I saw tears on both sides. I saw tears from someone overjoyed, an attorney that had been praying and working so many years to see this happen and was overjoyed that now there was an opportunity for life. And yet I saw tears of anger and frustration from a woman that felt that she didn't matter and wasn't valued on the other side of this issue. And I'm not asking you today where you stand on this or even what you think about this, but it's a matter of life and death, and it's also an opportunity for the church of God to speak in love, and we don't need to waste it. I can promise you that today is not the time for clever memes or jokes on social media. I can tell you that this is the time for us to continue to speak the truth in love and try to help people to navigate life. But many issues of our physical life, even our physical death, as important as those issues are, they're honestly eclipsed by the issues of eternal life and death. And and so much of our focus is uh, uh, on prolonging life or making our life on earth better or more comfortable for us, sometimes at the expense of sharing the gospel with those that need it most and taking it to the ends of the earth. In this church, as you read this letter, I want you to hear Paul's very practical advice. On the one hand, he's telling them this church is getting a lot of things right. He's admonishing and encouraging them that they get what life is supposed to be about. He says, you know what, church, you are an example, a life example to other people of what a church is supposed to do. And Paul himself was trying to be a life example of what faith is supposed to look like. He said, you imitate me, I imitate Christ. And and you see him encouraging this church and saying, you know what, I hear of your faith. I'm hearing of your example. It's resounding forth. And people are talking about what God has done in your life. And to be honest, I'm tired of hearing God's people talked about for the wrong reasons. And I'm ready for God's people to be talked about for the right ones. Not so much about what we don't do, but what we do to take the gospel to people that need it. So I'm praying that as we walk through this letter together, for myself and for all of us, that we would truly evaluate the weighty matters of life and death and think purposefully 
and intentionally about how we live our lives. This, I believe, is going to be a good journey for you and I together. So let's pray, and then let's open this book together and see what it would tell us. Father, thank you so much that in the midst of everything that is going wrong and everything that is going right and everything in between, you are the author and the perfecter of all life. And that you have given us an example to follow in your steps, Jesus. And then through the Apostle Paul, you're going to encourage people in the church, both in that day and our day, to live an example with our life that's pleasing to you. Just to speak words that edify you. To stand for things that matter. And stop fighting about things that don't. But to not live in fear, but faith. And I'm asking God that you might give me the words to say and how to say them in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together if you're able to stand. If not, keep your seats. But 1 Thessalonians 1, verses 1 to 10. And in this brief introduction to this letter, Paul begins to hit on some major thing, themes that he's going to expound throughout the rest. 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 1 to 10 says this, Paul and Silvanus and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of our God and Father, knowing that Brethren, beloved by God, his choice of you. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction, just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. You also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with joy of the Holy Spirit. So that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone forth so that we have no need to say anything. For they themselves report about us what kind of reception we had with you. And how you turn to God from idols to serve a living and true God. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. That is Jesus who rescues us from the wrath to come. You may be seated. So that's chapter one. That's his introduction. And if you think about when this was written and what was going on, I just want to highlight a couple of things and we'll unpack more as we walk through this letter. But around AD 49 or 51, Paul, he's in an 18 month stay at Corinth during his second missionary journey. Read about that in Acts 18. And he writes this letter. Thessalonica was a proud capital of the Roman, Roman province of Macedonia, had a population of well over 100,000. It's in the northern part of modern Greece. Thessalonica was a free city. This was kind of a, a big deal in that area. They were a free city, so they had local officials that governed them called politarchs, and they didn't have a Roman garrison there. They had so aligned themselves with the interests of Rome that they got this big tax break that they didn't have Roman soldiers and garrisons in their cities, that they were free to kind of govern themselves. And so this city had a vested interest in Rome, in Caesar. So when Paul starts talking to them about the king of all kings, they were pretty defensive of their king Caesar. And they didn't want some of these benefits taken away from them. And so this is the context in which this church began to flourish and began to stand firm in their faith, even though there was government pressure from city officials to not do it, they were doing it. And even though there was overall pressure from Rome and from um, the Jewish synagogue and those that were oppressing and, and trying to stop this from spreading, it kept spreading. 
Now, as you look at this whole letter, Paul is encouraging them to keep going, and something he comes back over and over and over again, he says, the king is coming back again. Jesus Christ died, he was buried, he ascended into heaven, and the king of all kings is coming back again. In every chapter of this short letter, he talks about the second coming of Christ and encourages them to live their life in faith and to not be confused about what life and death is all about. In fact, we're going to see him talk about what happens to those who die who really believe in Jesus. And he wants to make sure they're not confused about this because those that live for Christ, some of them were dying for their faith. And he says, you know what? Their life was not in vain. And you know what else? Death is not the end. And he's going to encourage them to stand firm. It's a letter of great affirmation and encouragement to the church. Paul's saying, I believe in you, but I believe that you can do even more. Paul knew this church well. He doesn't defend his apostleship as he does in other letters. He, he encourages them, and then he gets into some of these weighty issues of life and death. So if you look at verses 6 and 7, he says, You became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word and much tribulation with joy of the Holy Spirit, that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. Be an imitator. You imitated us. You imitated the Lord. Sometimes we think of imitation in our context as kind of a negative thing. You're just imitating them. But, but that's not the idea this word had. It, it was a, a, a good thing. Mimitase, you followed, you imitated, you, you took our example, you, you saw real faith, and now you have real faith. We imitated Christ, you imitated us, and now others are going to imitate you. You became an example the Greek word here, tupos, it, it means an exact reproduction, an example of what to follow. It, it, it was referred to this mark that was left by a hammer or die when they made a coin. It was an exact representation of the coin and another coin and another. And he was saying this is an example of what the church is supposed to be like. So for us as a church, we should lean in and listen. The life example. First truth, faithful work and loving labor. What we saw in this church was faithful work and loving labor. They were about putting their faith into action. With our kids, we've been going through the book of James together in our devotions as a family and faith and works, faith and action and how those go together. He's saying, you know what? You are living it, not just speaking it, but living it. Your actions and your words match. Verses two to four, you can zero in on this. We give thanks to God always for you making mention of you in our prayers, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith, your labor of love, and the steadfastness of hope that you have. Anybody know there's a lot of work that needs to be done? Can I get an amen into that? Is anybody working hard out there? I, I know some of you are working so hard, but I want you to know that God notices that. And I want you to know that when you work hard for the right reasons, it's worship. When you work hard for selfish reasons, it's legalism, even idolatry. But when you work hard because you love Jesus, it's worship. It's worship. He saw their faith, their work of faith. They had faith that fueled their work. They weren't working to be seen by man. They were working because they loved God. And people can tell the difference. When you're working and talking with people and trying to help them know the Lord, they see a difference of whether you're doing it because you have to or because you want to. And the only one that can change your have to to a want to is Jesus. He changes the motivation of your heart to where the things that you didn't want to do, now you want to do and you find joy in doing it is not working for your salvation. It's working from your salvation, and that makes all the difference in the world. You're loved by God. You're forgiven by God, and, and now you're trying to love other people that they may know his love, and so you're working, and you're helping, and you're serving, and those are the things that we should be talked about for. And work sometimes becomes very difficult but your labor must be motivated by love, right? The work of faith, loving labor, faithful work, loving 
labor. It was a labor of love. The Greek word here, uh, kapos, it, it, it denotes, th- this word labor is what I'm focusing on. It's, it's an arduous, wearying kind of toil done to the point of exhaustion. Uh, ergon, which is work, that focuses on the deed, what you're doing. But kapos looks at the effort that is expended in accomplishing that deed. Do you see the difference there? You're working, you're doing things. But then he says, I want you to continue this labor when that work becomes draining and difficult and you're tired and you're serving to the point of exhaustion. Don't quit. That's when God is most glorified. There have been so many times where it's not, it's not that hard to start a work. But it's very difficult to endure and to continue in it when you're exhausted and you feel like you're going to break. And I I have been there. And I, I know many of you have as well. There are some things that are so difficult and you feel so drained. But then we find such great encouragement for others that see the value in living your life. Like Paul says, my life is poured out as a drink offering to the Lord. I'm pouring out my strength into others. I'm, I'm discipling Timothy. I'm sending him out. And he's, he's writing this letter on behalf of these believers to say, I'm with you. I'm not there in person, but I'm with you. And I see your work and I hear that my faith that our faith is moving. and We are connected. And that encourages those that are tired and those that are weary, that your work and your labor is not in vain, that your life matters. When you look at verse 8, guys, look at verse 8. It's a really cool verse. It was about sharing the gospel with the world. House to house, door to door, friend to friend, city to city. Verse 8 says, For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith towards God has gone forth, so we don't need to say anything about it. When you read this Macedonia and Achaia, this, this covered a lot of territory. Macedonia, the Roman province of northeast section of Greece, and the Macedonian churches that are included in that were, were Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea, Achaia, the, the Roman province directly south of Macedonia. There were churches in these cities, Athens and Corinth, and from the north to the south, these two provinces of several hundred miles contained all these churches that were established on Paul's missionary journeys. And he's like, we hear you. We hear about you. We know that your faith is real. Word is traveling. It speaks of being both a model and a messenger. The, the word message here, you know, it, it says that it is sounded forth. Ekatai, this is the only place that it's used in the New Testament, this word, sounded forth. To blast forth, to sound forth intensely is what it carries the idea of. So it, it rang out. It, it's like a, a, a megaphone. They, their, their love is speaking out, shouting out to everyone that would listen that our God is real and our God lives. And this love of Christ can transform a life, can change a heart that was stoned to become a heart of flesh. Keep spreading the good news. I wonder how much do you rejoice today just that you're able to be a part of the work and the labor for the kingdom of God. Just the fact that you get to talk about him from a real relationship. Guys, let's don't get weary in doing good. Let's don't give up in talking to our neighbors. Let's don't write people off like they don't matter. Every person on earth, regardless of their color, regardless of their socioeconomic status, all people are created, created in the image of God and are made to worship him and know him. 
If you've got that figured it out yet, don't look down on those that haven't because you may help them to get further and further away from the truth. But you keep working, you keep enduring, you keep loving, and you be faithful. Rejoice that you have life and the ability to serve Jesus and to further his kingdom. The second truth is hopeful endurance. They've got faithful work, they have loving labor, they also have hopeful endurance. Their faith costs them something. Friends, relationships, their faith cost them something when they stood up for Christ and they were willing to pay the price and endure no matter what came because they believed so they could endure, hopeful endurance. Verses two to four, he says, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith, your labor of love, steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of our God and Father, knowing, brethren beloved by God, his choice of you. We hope, every believer right now listening to this, hopes because of the relationship they have with Jesus Christ and the future that he has promised. The more we get frustrated by the way things are in the world today, the, sin, the sinfulness, the brokenness, the hatred, the evil, you see that everywhere. The more we be consumed just with that, we miss looking past that to the new heaven and the new earth and what God is doing behind the scenes. The lost are still being saved. There are still those that are repenting and believing. There are those that are born again and also turn from sin and begin to follow Christ and encourage others to do the same. And you can miss that in the midst of all the pain and you can get discouraged and not want to endure if you are only working for things in this life, then you will not endure. When the hardships come, you'll quit. Jesus told so many parables about the thorns and that would choke, choke out the seed that was scattered because many people start off well but then fall away because they don't have endurance because there's no real root of faith and persecution comes and they lose hope. Hope and endurance are linked. Friends, please hear me in that. If you lose hope, you won't endure. If you keep hope, you will endure. The moment your hope begins to falter is the moment you begin to start walking slower and may possibly even turn from the path that the Lord has you to walk. But our hope, our, our love, our purpose is so connected to Christ. The reason why they can endure is because of their relationship with God. You'll see that and we'll, we'll bring that out even more in the next truth, but they had hope. Elpis, it was firm because their hope was not in themselves. Their hope was not in their abilities to work. Their hope was anchored in Christ and the Holy Spirit and his word and the will of God the Father. So they weren't hoping in what they could do. They were hoping and trusting and enduring because of what God was doing and because of what he will do. When you believe what God has done to this point, you also trust him for what he'll do in the future. You read Revelation and you say, this is the how it's going to end. The good guys will win, but not because they're good, but because the good God will forgive and give them his righteousness and make them good and then make a way to bring them home that all people might be connected to him in Christ. And that's what we are able to hope in, and that is why we can't quit. They were anchored in Christ. But you know, we're given more than that. Not, not, just, to, not just the Spirit of God, God the Father, the words of His Son. We're also able to encourage one another, people. We believe and we're not the only ones who believe. There are people that feel like they're standing all alone, and they're not. Missionaries right now with the IMB in very dark places and feel alone, but they're not. We're connected through prayer. We are connected through purpose. And though they may be the only light in a dark, dark village, there is light, and they're not alone. Because you and I stand with them. 
That's what Paul is doing for these believers. That's why he wrote these letters to all the churches that we're reading today. We can encourage one another. Steadfastness, endurance. It conveys the idea of perseverance, of staying under pressure to leave. Do you notice, just just look at verse 4. He calls them brethren, beloved by God. Brothers, sisters, brethren, loved by God. In fact, as we walk through this letter together, he uses that phrase 19 times. 19 times he says, brothers, brethren, we're together. You can't see my face, but I'm sending you this because we're together. We're connected, and I'm hearing about your faith. Don't lose heart. Keep going. Because you're not alone in this fight. The enemy loves to isolate us and to make us feel cut off from one another and God. So the people of God need to work doubly hard to stay connected in Christ and to encourage one another and to not watch someone struggle without coming along beside them and helping them to bear these burdens walking with them and encouraging them in the Lord to continue to fight the good fight and keep the faith. The third and final truth I see in this brief introduction is this. A genuine God relationship. Now, notice we we hit these first two points. Faithful work, loving labor, hopeful endurance, But the only reason why either of those things are even possible is because it was flowing from a genuine God relationship. If you follow rules and enforce rules and you have morality apart from God, you'll become legalist, you'll become very dry, very cynical. But if you have a genuine God relationship and you're encouraging people to have that same relationship so they experience the true freedom that only Christ can bring, all of your labor, all of your work, all that you do, you're doing it just to be pleasing to God. And so you leave the results to God and you're only focused on your obedience to do what he's calling you to do. We start looking at results, we start comparing, we start getting prideful, we start pointing at the work and saying, well, why is someone else not working as hard as I am? Or why is someone else having such an easy path when mine is so hard? You don't focus on any of that when you're just living for God, his path for your life, and it's flowing from a genuine God relationship. The reason why this church was such a light and an example is because Paul, in the very beginning of this letter, nails it down over and over again that they had a real relationship with God. That what they were doing is because they loved God, God loved them. That was the source of their strength and the reason for their labor. Look at even verse 1. This is, it's not out of order on your outline, but look at your, look at your outline instead of the screen. Verse 1 says, Paul and Silvanus and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. Three very big distinctives of the church. It's the church of the Thessalonians. They are in God the Father. They are in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is what gave them their identity. They are in Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. This one phrase right here combines in all the major aspects of his redemptive work. Lord, he is described as the creator and sovereign ruler, the one that made us, bought us, rules over us, the one that we owe full allegiance to. Jesus, Jehovah, saves. The name of his humanity given to him at his birth, Matthew 1, verse 21 and 25. And then Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, that came to redeem us all. The Lord Jesus Christ, the reason why You're able to do this is because you know the Lord Jesus Christ. And I hope that people know of us that we follow the Lord Jesus Christ above everything else in our life. Before they know what sports teams we cheer for, 
before they know where we work, where we went to school. I pray they know of us that we follow the Lord Jesus Christ, and we don't need to forget that. Martin writes in this letter that follows, Paul instructed the believers regarding their identity, their place among the brethren, the way in which they should interact with one another. All of this flows from their identity connected to Christ because he is their Lord and Savior. And he says, grace and peace to you. It's a common salutation throughout Paul's letter. Grace and peace to you. In verse 5, you want to see if they really got it, if their faith was pretend or not? He says, our gospel didn't come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction, just as you know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. You also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation, with joy, with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Tribulation, again here, it, it, it carries the idea of a very intense pressure. There was great struggle when they stood for faith, but they did. And they had full conviction, solid belief, 100% assurance. Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I will follow God even if no one else does. I would rather obey God than man. If it costs me my life, it costs me my life, but I will not deny Christ. That is the conviction and the assurance and the certainty they had in the gospel. And I, and I love how Paul says, you know what? We, you saw what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. He, he mentions three, himself and two others that came to them, that showed them real faith, that lived out their faith before them, that shared the gospel with them. He says, you know what kind of men we proved to be. Not just said we would be, but proved to be because our faith was real. And now you have begun to imitate that real faith in us. And now others are going to learn to imitate that real faith in you because you become an example you become an example of what real faith looks like. And I, I, I think somehow, unfortunately, we, we're forgetting why we're still alive. We're alive to try to show a lost world what real faith looks like. What grace can do when it gets hold of a sinful man or a sinful woman and they become born again by the Holy Spirit. And I see so much anger and bickering and backbiting and just spewing words of hate instead of words of life. And guys, if that's been you, even up till today, if that's been you, that can change. Guys, that can change right here and right now. You could stop complaining and bickering and start praising and serving. It's just a, a, a switch that God can give you. If you want it to happen, it will happen. Then you can have joy in the midst of these tribulations. It's not that our circumstances might get better. They may even get worse. But you can have joy in your tribulation because of the Holy Spirit and what he's doing in your life. We keep our focus on the main thing and we can still rejoice. Win or lose doesn't matter because the ultimate victory through the cross is ours. And we didn't deserve it. We didn't buy it. And we're in awe that he thought enough to give it to us. Saved by grace through faith. And now we want to share that with others. Because we have a real relationship with God and we want other people to have it too. I'm not closed-minded when I tell people that Jesus is the only way. I'm being very loving because Jesus is the only way. No other religion on earth can do what God can do. No, no amount of idol worship can ever take the place of the indwelling God, the living God that will save you forever. If you look at verses 9 and 10, it says, they themselves report to us what kind of reception we had with you, knowing how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, 
who rescues us from the wrath to come. That's the gospel there. You, you turn from idols, false gods and philosophies, and you turn to Christ, the living God, that will come back again, the, the, the Son of God that saves us from the wrath to come. Because as we heard in John 3.23, be reminded of John 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. He takes our wrath, the wrath that's supposed to be on us because of our sin, and, and he pays for it. Jesus does. No idol does that. No philosophy does that. No one else does that. They had repented of their idolatrous past and trusted in the Lord with full conviction, genuine assurance, faithful hope, working by faith, enduring by love, keeping the hope of what is to come and their priorities straight as they live their faith before a lost and dying world. What are the idols in your life? There's a lot of people that don't think they really have idols in their life. Just because you don't have a shelf in your house with Hindu idols along it does not mean there are no idols in your heart and in your life. When Jesus talked about them serving the God of mammon or wealth, there are so many today that that, that is their God. It is wealth. It is finance. That is what they pursue and base their identity and their future in. And it's letting them down. And they're not sure why. There are those whose idol is their own comfort. They, they do not want anyone to rock the boat, to mess with their life, to, to mess with their schedule. They got stuff they want to do. And if you try to come and mess that up, they're going to turn on you pretty quick. You ever ask someone to do something and then all of a sudden they whip out a calendar and start beating you with it? How dare you ask me to serve the Lord? Do you not know how busy I am? I got this and this and this and grandkids and great grands and this and this and this and I got to be at work at 5 a.m. And then you're like, hey, whoa, hey, wait, wait, wait. Let's just talk about what God says and maybe you should do that too. We get so busy whether our God is comfort or worldly productivity, sometimes that's our God. Our job is where we don't say this out loud, but that becomes our idol. We're working so hard to get a promotion or to be noticed or recognized at work. We so value our, our, our annual reviews and the way other people look at us that we, we tie our worth to that in that we, we work to make that better, sometimes even at the expense of our walk with God. Am I telling you how to live your life and how to live your time? No. I'm telling you that if Jesus is the Lord of your life, you better listen because he will. And I know from my personal experiences, there's a lot of things that I want to do that God says no, because you need to do this because this is more important and this is better. And as long as you're telling God what you're going to do and you fit him in as a part of your life, then he's not the Lord of your life. And he must be. Because the, the days are drawing dark and the time is short and I just don't know how much longer we have. I don't say that to scare people. I just say that because I believe it's true. I don't know how much longer I have. I don't know how much longer I'm going to be alive. But I do know that my life is a gift from God and that I could waste it trying to make myself more comfortable or I could invest it by making God known and helping other people know his grace and strength so that their faith continues even after I go home. So don't lose hope. Continue and keep going. We've got to live prepared for the second coming of Christ because he could come back at any moment. I don't know when. No one knows the day and the hour. But I do know that when he does come back, the bride of Christ better be busy doing what he's told us to do. He died that we might have life, not that we might have 
comfort, but that we might have life and abundant life that lets the world know of his love. I listen to Christian radio, Air One and K-Love when I'm working in the office, and I heard a story on Air One this week about a woman in an SUV, and she was driving along, and she accidentally mashed the pedal to the floor, and it wasn't the brake pedal, it was the gas pedal. So she popped over a curb, and her whole SUV crashed into the bay. And then you see security cameras, and there's some people that get out to watch this, and most of them have their phones out, and they're recording it. And then there's a teenage boy that you see. He comes up. He doesn't hesitate a second. He dives off into the bay, swims down to the bottom, pries open the door, and rescues that woman and brings her back to the surface. And they were talking about how cool it was that a lot of adults were standing around there watching this, videoing it, and then here's a young boy that leaps off and swims down to rescue her. Where am I going with this? Are you the type of person that's going to watch and record it, or are you going to jump in and try to do something about it? And I think for far too long we have watched the world and said, well, it's just going to hell in a handbasket. Quit it. Jump in, dive in, and start pulling people to Christ. Because we don't have time to waste anymore. And this letter, I am praying, will light a fire in all of us to be about God and talking about the matters of life and death while there's still time. Let's pray. Father, right here and right now, we need you and we love you, and I am praying that you would move. Move in our hearts. Move in our lives. Help us to love you more than we do. Help us to care more about others. And I'm, I'm talking to myself. I need you, God. I get selfish, I get frustrated, I get lazy. I need you to change my life and heart that my life might be an example for others to follow. We want to be people that are filled with faithful work and loving labor, people that have hopeful endurance, but we have those things because we have a genuine relationship with God. Let us find our identity and our strength in you. Let us live for you more than we ever have before. I'm asking for your help. Let your Holy Spirit move right now amongst everyone listening that you would bring the gospel truth that you died for our sins, that you will provide a way for us to live forever if we repent and believe. And I'm praying that we would know that with full conviction, complete assurance, and we would stand for you. Let us be saved and let us be sent into a world that needs to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together.